give a talk that I gave at Occupy Chicago and Occupy the South Side uh, a few months ago uh, called The Failure of Corporate School Reform Towards a New Common School Movement. And this is part of my uh, new book, The Failure of Corporate School Reform. In the United States, a corporate model of schooling has overtaken educational policy, practice, and curriculum in nearly all aspects of educational reform. While this movement began on the political right, the corporate school model has been heralded across the political spectrum and is aggressively embraced by both major parties. Corporate school reformers champion private sector approaches to reform, including especially privatization, deregulation, and the importation of terms and assumptions from business. While they imagine public schools as private businesses, districts as markets, students as consumers, and knowledge as product. Corporate school reform aims to transform public schooling into a private industry nationally by replacing public schools with privately managed charter schools, voucher schemes, scholarship tax credits for private schooling, to name a few. The massive expansion of deunionized, nonprofit, privately managed charters uh, with short term contracts is um, an intermediary step towards the declaration of their failure and replacement by the for-profit industry in educational management organizations, or EMOs. EMOs extract profit by cutting teacher pay and educational resources while relying on high teacher turnover and labor precarity. Corporate school reform seeks solutions to public problems in private sector ways from contracting out schools and services to union busting, a wholesale embrace of numerical benchmarking and database tracking, and the modeling of schooling and administration on multiple aspects of corporate culture. The policy hawks make demands, for example, for teacher entrepreneurialism, or insist that students dress like retail chain workers and call school head CEO, or like Chicago CEO, John Belkazar, or install corporate models of numerical accountability, paying students for grades, and teachers for test scores, or leaders play intricate Wall Street style shell games with best performance to show rising, quote, return on investment. Or teachers assign students the task of crafting a resume for Benjamin Franklin. Um, BP was involved in creating California science curriculum. The examples are endless, and I can just stand up here and keep giving you more examples of it. Despite the fact that corporate school reforms have expanded at an exponential speed, the dominant corporate school reforms have failed on their own terms. Such reformers have insisted on, quote, accountability through test scores and lowering costs, but it's precisely in reference to these accountability measures that corporate school reforms have failed. The failing policies that are being aggressively implemented nonetheless include contracting out management to privately managed charters or for-profit ed educational management organizations, um, vouchers and neo-vouchers, expanding commercialism, imposing corporate so-called turnaround models on schools and faculty that often involve firing entire faculties and administrations, um, right down to the janitorial staff, reducing curriculum and pedagogy to narrow numerically quantifiable and anti-intellectual, anti-critical test-based reforms, the creation of portfolio districts that imagine districts as a stock portfolio and schools as stock investments uh, with the superintendent as a hedge fund manager, um, reorganizing teacher education and educational leadership on the model of the MBA degree, the elimination of advanced degrees and certification in favor of pay for test performance schemes such as value added assessment. The key point here is that all of, there's no evidence behind any of these reforms, and yet these reforms are being pushed forward anyway. These corporate school reforms are deeply interwoven with commercial interests in the multi-billion dollar task and textbook publishing industries, the information technology and database tracking industries, and the contracting industries. The corporate sector has in the last decade positioned education in the US as a roughly $600 billion per year industry, ripe for takeover, um, commonly compared to the US uh, military industries. As directions for future economic growth are uncertain, public tax money in public services appears to corporations and the super rich who are flush from dec decades of upward redistributions as tantalizing to pillage. These upward redistributions of public wealth and governance are particularly obvious in Wisconsin, as Pat was speaking about. In New Jersey, as tax cuts on the super rich and corporations and slush funds for business development are funded by defunding public and higher education, attacking teacher pay, benefits, and unions, expanding preposition schemes, and shifting educational costs onto individual working class and professional class individuals. The same agenda is being enacted in Michigan, Indiana, Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania, 
to name a few. Chicago, where I live and teach, could be considered kind of blueprint for this with its uh, Renaissance 2010 plan implemented by now Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan. So I want to talk about how corporate school reform is in closure of the commons. Corporate school reform represents not merely better or worse school reform approaches, adjusting pedagogical methods, tweaking the curriculum, and so on. It's crucially about redistributing control over social life, and as such is part of a much broader trend it represents a capitalist enclosure of the commons, that is, the violent taking of the shared substance of our social being. As Slavoj Žižek points out, there are three crucial enclosures of the common at present. Uh, the first is the commons of culture, the immediately socialized forms of cognitive capital, primarily language, our means of communication and education, but also the shared infrastructure of public transport, electricity, the postal system, and so on. Second is the commons of external nature, threatened by pollution and exploitation, from oil to rain, forests, and the natural habitat itself. Third is the commons of internal nature, the biogenetic inheritance of humanity, with new biogenetic technology, the creation of a new person, in the literal sense of changing, changing human nature uh, becomes a realistic prospect. And Zizek emphasizes a fourth enclosure of the commons, which involves the de facto apartheid situation of what he calls new walls and slums that physically enclose people, separating the excluded from the included. These four enclosures of the common are being struggled over and the stakes in the struggle are for Zizek the very survival of the species and the planet itself. Capitalist enclosure of the natural commons produces ecological catastrophe. Capitalist enclosure of the knowledge commons makes ideas into private property rather than freely shared and exchange knowledge and of use and potential universal benefit. Capitalist enclosure transforms the biological information that is the stuff of life into property, setting a stage for new forms of bioslavery and profit-based control. Corporate school reform pollutes with and deepens these enclosures of the commons. It makes knowledge into a commodity rather than being shared and freely exchanged. It naturalizes a natural world defined by private ownership rather than public care. It privatizes the process of maturation and socialization, making human development into business and children into product. Finally, the lower tier of privatized public schooling expands repression in the form of new walls and slums. The most significant aspect of corporate school reform involves privatizing the public schools. In an economic sense, privatization involves enclosing commonly held wealth, assets, and land. Value is produced by collective labor in any enterprise, but capitalism individualizes the profits from collective labor. As David Harvey points out, the common as a form of collective laboring must ground collective rather than individualized property rights and result in collective control over the productive production process. Public schools are not simply commonly held property, but the collective labor of teachers, administrators, and staff comprises the common of the public schools as well. Corporate school reform encloses and appropriates for capital the collective labor of teachers, administrators, staff, and students, and it does so by using public financing for privatizing public schools. In fact, as real estate schemes by charters and the vast array of contracting deals exemplify, corporate school reform also encloses the collective property of the public school. In some cases, the actual public school building <coughs> is given to a private entity, such as a charter school. More frequently, the contracting arrangements that districts do with for-profit firms results in the extraction of surplus wealth, most often by decreasing teacher pay and skimming off profit by contractors and inf inflating administrative salaries. For Harvey, the problem of the commons is that unregulated individualized capital accumulation threatens to destroy the labor and the land, which are the two basic common property resources. The promise of corporate school reform for its proponents is that in it increases the efficiency of the teacher laborer through the enforcement of discipline, tighter controls over time, tighter controls over subject matter, and over pedagogical methods and that such alleged efficiencies increase the delivery of knowledge to the student consumer, increasing in turn the potential economic efficiency 
of the future student worker. The promise is false at every point. For example, chartering, which has become captured by a corporate logic and much of it exists for profit extraction, aims to replicate and scale up the most efficient delivery models, extend the teacher day, pay the teacher less, burn the teacher out, turn over the teacher workforce. All of these are proven effects of chartering, and there's no doubt that these are good means of maximizing short-term profit for for-profit management companies and other contractors. The problem is not only, as a liberal like Linda Darling Hammond emphasizes, that these disruptive reforms are bad for test-based student achievement. More significantly, these are means of worsening the creative, intellectual, curiosity fostering, and critically engaged qualities of teaching, and also worsening the future productive force of the student's labor. But controlled, rigid, anti-critical teaching results not in subjects with a greater capacity for economic productivity, but the opposite. If the goal is to produce docile, disciplined, low-skilled workers or marginalized people who are excluded from the economy altogether, then these corporate school reforms are right on target. However, ethics and politics aside, this is short-sighted as an economic strategy if, as the corporate school reformers allege, the aim of public schooling is to produce future high-tech workers with knowledge of math and science and the creativity to create new projects and create new value. The dominant justification for corporate school reform is for the U.S. to develop its labor capacity in the high technology arena toward the end of winning global economic competition. Usually proponents of the dominant justification call for encouraging students to develop their capacities for entrepreneurialism. It's difficult to see how eroding the capacity of teacher labor to inspire vigorous creative thinking and intellectual curiosity could contribute to such a capitalist goal. The point is not to be missed here is that um, even on its own bad terms of education for capitalist accumulation, corporate school reform undermines its own aims. The closure of the public school through privatization does create short-term profit, turning kids into commodities and creating a new two-tiered system that is privatized at the bottom. But enclosure destroys the labor and resources of the public school. That is, it destroys the value of it by pillaging it as a productive force. If we consider corporate school reform in terms of the recent literature on the commons, we can ask the question of how it helps us formulate a response to the problems posed by public school privatization in terms of economic control, political control, and cultural control. The issue at stake here is not whether privatization threatens critical public and democratic forms of education. We begin with assuming that as a given. Rather, the question is how do critical forms of education create the conditions for collective labor towards collective benefit, and how do private forms of education create the conditions for collective labor towards private benefit. Part of what is at stake in the privatization of schools is the diminishment of the public sphere. So we should recognize that there are at least four clear ways that those committed to democratic education must understand how public control differs from private control. So the first way is public versus private ownership and control. For-profit education companies are able to skim public tax money that would otherwise be reinvested in educational services and shunt it to investor profits. These profits take, take concrete form as the limousines, jet airplanes, uh, and mansions that public tax money provides to rich investors like Chris Woodall, the creator of Edison Learning's $42 million Hamptons home. Uh, <laughs> these profits, um, also take the symbolic form as they are used to hire public relations firms to influence parents, communities, and other investors to have faith in the company. This is a parasitical financial relationship that results in the management of the schools in ways that will maximize the potential profit for investors while cutting costs. This is tended to result in anti-unionism, the reduction of education to the most measurable and replicable forms, assaults on teacher autonomy, and so on. Um, there's no evidence that the draining of public wealth and its siphoning to capitalists has improved public education or that it's required for the improvement of public education. If the state is going to use privatization as a tool, as advocates of the third way in the United Kingdom did, then it could exercise authoritative state action directly in ways that do not upwardly redistribute wealth or funnel such wealth into misrepresenting the effects of privatization. Moreover, such a redistribution over economic control shifts the collective control over the processes of teaching and learning 
to the owner or private manager of the privatized educational approach. It captures such educational labor and channels it towards profit making for owners in the short term and future exploitable capitalist labor relations in the long term. Second, um, the second thing that's at stake in, in public versus private control over public schooling is the question of cultural politics. Privatization affects the politics of the curriculum. A for-profit company and a non-profit um, dependent on a private venture philanthropy cannot have a critical curriculum that makes central, for example, the ways privatization threatens democratic values and ideals. While most public schools do not have wide-ranging critical curricula, the crucial issue is that some do and most could. This is a matter of public struggle. Privatization forecloses such struggle by shifting control to private hands and framing out possibilities that are contrary to institutional and structural interest. The possibility of developing and expanding critical pedagogical practices are a major, major casualty of privatization. Democratic society requires citizens capable of debate, deliberation, dissent, and the tools of intellectual engagement. Privatization fosters anti-democratic instrumental and transmission-oriented approaches to pedagogy, such as standardized testing and standardization of curriculum. The privatization of mass media represents an important parallel to the privatization of public schooling with regard to cultural politics. For-profit media disallows representations and questioning that run counter to the institutional interests of corporations. The corporate takeover of schooling means the overemphasis on standards and standardization testing and accountability that replicates a corporate logic in which measurable task performance and submission to authority become utterly central. Intellectual curiosity, investigation, teacher autonomy, and critical pedagogy, not to mention critical theory, have no place in this view. Democratic forms of education enable critical forms of agency, fostering political interpretation that can form the basis for collective social action. Critical curriculum and school models could provide the means for theorizing and acting to challenge the very labor exploitation to which schools such as these prepare students to submit. The third form, uh, the third aspect of what's at stake in public versus private control is forms of publicity and privacy, including secrecy and transparency. Private companies are able to keep much of what they do secret. EMOs, educational management organizations, and charters that straddle the line between public and private selectively reveal financial and performance data that would further their capacity to lure investors. Such manipulation is endemic to privatization schemes, and such secrecy represents a tactic on the part of privatizers to disallow collective control over school financing and budgets. The secrecy of privatization prevents collective educational labor for common benefit. And fourth and lastly, Public versus private forms of selfhood are also at stake in this question of control. Privatization produces social relations defined through capitalist reproduction that function pedagogically to instantiate habits of docility and submission to authority at odds with collective control, dialogue, debate, dissent, and other public democratic practices. Privatization fosters individualization in part by encouraging everyone to understand education as a private service primarily about maximizing one's own capacity for competition. This runs counter to value in public schooling for the benefit to all. A new common school movement can be involved with producing a new public person imbued with the capacity to recognize and value both the collective labor of social life and imagine ways of common benefit for such labor. In both the neoliberal and liberal visions of schooling, the collective labor of teaching and learning <coughs> aims for a combination to the existing economic structure and political forms that foster it. This is an economic structure that individualizes benefit from such labor. The task ahead for the critical perspective is to imagine pedagogical practices, curriculum, and school organization that can enact the global commons. <coughs> How can critical pedagogy make central common labor for common benefit? What paths should teachers and students take with communities in recovering control over the work of teaching and learning? How can the struggle against corporate school reform not simply demand limits on testing and a cessation to privatization in all its guises, but also demand that public education be the basis for reimagining the economy 
in truly democratic forms, reimagining the political system and political action, not beholden to purchase and commercialized elections, and reimagine the culture as a public rather than a private one. Corporate school reform threatens the possibility for public schools to develop as places where knowledge, pedagogical authority, and experiences are taken up in relation to broader political, ethical, cultural, and material struggles, informing competing claims to truth. While the battle for critical public schools and against privatization and other manifestations of neoliberalism are valuable struggles in themselves, they should be viewed as an interim goal to what ought to be the broader goals of developing practices, modes of organizing, and habits of social and self-questioning that aim towards the redistribution of state and corporate power from the elites to the public while expanding critical consciousness and a radically democratic ethos. A new common school movement has an inevitably hopeful dimension to it. The common can be built and expanded, and it can never be fully enclosed, because there are parts of human experience that can't be turned into property and have to be held in common. Compassion, ideas, and the planet itself must be held in common. A first step for educators and others committed to equality and justice to enact a new common school movement is to propagate some key talking points to transform public discourse about public education. I take this um, from the public relations industry and <laughs> political strategists. Um, so the first talking point. So I want people to repeat these all over the place. The first one. Corporate school reform is spreading and stands to create a new two-tier education system. And for those of you who are Canadian and aren't experiencing quite what I'm describing here, you can take this as a, a warning, <laughs> as an admonition, and tell your, tell your friends that this is the, the truth in the United States. <laughs> um, second, corporate school reform has failed. This is the most important one. Corporate school reform has failed. I'm going to say it one more time. Corporate school reform has failed. <laughs> Charters, vouchers, privatization, educational management companies have failed to deliver what they promised, namely higher student test scores and lower costs. Um, third, corporate school reform worsens racial segregation. Gary Myron did a terrific study of this um, at the Evaluation Center at Eastern Michigan University. Um, so, next mantra point. Corporate school reform deepens inequality in educational resources. Um, corporate school reform introduces audit culture and a new market bureaucracy that is expensive, misdirects resources, and promotes misery and inefficiency. And this is actually what I was intending to talk about um, today. I had a four-page paper to give to you specifically about the new market bureaucracy, um, which is, um, I'll per perhaps get into a little bit later. Yeah. Um, the second to last talking point here is that corporate school reform has no way of dealing with ecological crisis. And lastly, corporate school reform promotes the values of an economic system designed to expand profit and consumerism over human values such as love, care, common living, and common labor for common benefit. So a second step in addition to um, repeating these talking points and trying to change the public discourse about um, corporate school reform and get the idea out that it's actually a complete failure and needs to be thoroughly abandoned um, is to actually expand the um, Occupy movement and begin occupying uh, or continue occupying public schools um, for urban students and teachers and academics <coughs> to begin occupying um, suburban schools to um, do teach-ins for collective human values and disrupt corporate schooling um, to begin occupying the education corporations themselves. So the, what I finished with it when I gave this talk at Occupy was that the public schools belong to the 99%. It's time um, to take them back and ally with um, the Occupy movement, the teachers unions, and um, those public schools that have been targeted for closure and privatization. 